This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development by a group of guys with one thing in common. We love Drupal. Recorded live on Wednesday afternoons in the Google Hangout, visit us at TalkingDrupal.com. This is episode 12, August 28, 2013. Content Approval Workflow. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hello, hello. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Good, 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 good. Well, here we are. This week, episode 12. We're still in our double digits. Um, the title well, of this we're episode not going backwards. is... What's that? It's good we're not going backwards. We're not going backwards. It feels like that some of these days. Um, <laughs> in this episode, we're talking about content approval workflow, which we've expanded a little bit in our pre-show meeting here to... Um, also, not just talk about the workflow of getting content approved, but also content permissions and authoring. So that's what we're going to address today. And with us, we have Jason Pomental from H and W Design. Hi, Jason. Hey, Steve. Nice it's to quiet. Be back. It's quiet there now. It was awful noisy there this morning. I'll give it time. Give it time. You want to tell us about the guests you have visiting you? <laughs> well, we. Um, we we got rid of one house house uh, denizen last week. We dropped Trevor off at college, and uh, this week we picked up an extra four-legged guest. Uh, our friend our friend Corindon and Jen's Basset Hound Buford is going to be staying with us for a few days. So Trevor will be just happy to know his room's already been taken. <laughs> oh well, we've yeah we've been clearing it out to get the Airbnb listing ready to go on there. So, you know, <laughs> we don't want it to go go to waste. It'd be, it'd be great if their names were actually like Brendan and Bonnie, because then it would be Brendan and Bonnie's Basset Hound Buford. <laughs> I'll, I'll let them know to get to work on the name change. And also John Pacozzi from Rubik Design and Interactive. Good afternoon. Anything new with you, John, that you want to share with us? Uh, we are working feverishly on uh, newrubicdesign.com, so look for that coming coming to a web browser near you. Well, John, sometimes that's a sign of a business having no work that they're working on their own website. That's not the case, right? <laughs> that is never <laughs> that is never the case. All right, I, uh, just wondering. <laughs> yeah, plenty plenty of stuff to keep me busy. All right. I didn't say it was going to be coming to a web browser near you soon. anytime soon. <laughs> right. Okay, that was the key. <laughs> right. And we also have Nick Laughlin from Enlightened Design. Good afternoon. I just uh, redesigned my own site as well, actually. Um, finally got around to installing SAS Compass and uh, something called Style Prototyping and used myself as the guinea pig. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. So what is Style Prototyping? Style Prototyping is a human generator that creates a style guide, color guide, component guide, and a couple other things out of the box using human, grunt, bower, compass, and sass. It's pretty slick. <laughs> yeah, you, you're short a couple of acronyms in there. Yeah, insert, insert your acronym No, they, they, weren't, they weren't acronyms. They were technologies. But <laughs> it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was pretty interesting setting it up. It took a couple of days. But I think it's well worth it. Uh, good. We'll have to hear more about that a little later. So let's get started with uh, content authoring access and approval. So three areas here to drill into. Um, and I think at some point on every site, you know, it's never the first site you're building or the first project you're working on, but soon you get to the point of really then sort of fine-tuning into who can, who can update this content. And, and the question always comes up is... Um, if this person edits the content, who's going to approve it before it goes live? And I, and I think in, when you get to an organization of any size, probably bigger than three people, that question often comes up. So we wanted to kind of drill on that a little bit today. So someone's trying to say something. I, I hear it. Go yeah, I would, say, I would say that <laughs> content access permissions and workflows are, yeah. is probably the place where you're going to check the most check boxes. Um, by far, there are the most options, but it's 
definitely one of the most important pieces of any complex site, deciding who can access what. Um, it, it covers security implications as well as usability. Um, and it's definitely one of the things that I find needs to be tested the most because yes. you have to test every single role, multiple roles, many, many times. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where it works for you as an admin, but nobody else. Um, also, not yeah. not only just testing the the basics, but coming up with use cases for each role and seeing if mm -hmm. those use cases hold up to to the tests is important as well. A um, couple of months ago, we launched a uh, intranet, and that it was for you know upwards of fifteen thousand users, and and we had to test multiple use cases to whether people were going to be allowed to do one thing and not allowed to do another and who was allowed to approve this and who was allowed to approve that. So I do agree. There is a lot of checkbox checking and a lot of testing going on there. And, and any time you can, you should always be trying to keep things as simple as possible. The more complex you try to make any of these, especially on the workflow side, the more complex you try to make this, the more difficult it's going to be. So, and, and, and in terms of workflow, um, oftentimes people think they need more than they really do. So you end up building yeah. something really complex, and the workflow ends up getting in the way of work actually getting done and content getting written. Getting written. So it's kind of funny. I think that's the hardest thing to walk clients through when they, when they bring that question up, whether it's a school you know, allowing teachers to post or, um, you know, the communications director grudgingly allowing people from from marketing to, to put blog posts up or whatever it is, um, there's a lot of nervousness and I think there tends to be this, like, inclination towards more control um, than they will ever really want to exercise. Right, so, so let's start here with a, let's talk about access first. Just the things that you can do to the system to control access to content. So um, uh, based on someone's login, their role, how can you tighten up people seeing content um, and not seeing content? What's, what's some of the ways that you guys would do that? Well, I, th I think it's good to, to cover what Drupal does on its own. You know, before sure. you add a, right. a single module in, you know, so least number of complications and um, and and over overlapping of things. So you know, Drupal allows you to create multiple content types. It allows you to create multiple roles, and you know, by default, you have your administrator role, and you have, generally speaking, anonymous users and authenticated users. And oftentimes, the first step is to create some sort of content admin role, and perhaps some sort of authenticated user role if you have some kind of restriction on content that should only be viewed. Let's say you've got um, data sheets as a content type and you only want authenticated users like people who have signed up on your website to be able to see those. With no other additional modules you can go into the permissions after you've created those content types and allow um, access to content based on um, whether or not you want to allow anybody, any anonymous user to see content or not. Like that's that's a very basic thing. But then you can also assign the ability to edit, add, and delete um, content based on content types with those roles. And that often can carry you, you know, most if not all the way there um, in many situations without adding any other complexity. Yeah, and, and an important point about that, too, is you can still, even within the roles, uh, Drupal out of the box allows you to add another bin per user. So by default, each content type you create gets five permissions. The first one is the ability to create new content. The second one is the ability to edit their own, con like their own user's content. The third is to edit any user's content of that content type. Then delete your own and delete any. And that allows you to say this person, this role has permission to create content and edit their own content, but they can't sabotage somebody else's content of the same role. Or this person's an admin of this kind of content type, they can edit anybody's content as long as it's that piece. 
Um, so that way, if they need to moderate it, change something, or edit something, they can, even if they weren't the one that originally created it. And a key point here is all of the stuff we're talking about here is triggered on the fact of who is defined as the author of that content. Right. Yes. Which is a field right in, on each piece of content. Right. And yeah, by default, it's awesome. whoever creates it is set as the author. Yeah. Exactly. So after you get, we're in the box, we've done some permissions there, so let's get out of the box and uh, figure out what are some of the other ways that you may want to um, implement access. Um, one thing that we're doing right now for our own website, um, and we do have work, John, is <laughs> but we're, we're implementing... Um, a knowledge base for our customers because we have like floating documents all the time for for things for customers and how to do this and that and we ended up putting in a knowledge base which is really when we came down to building it it was just really our blog but putting some access around it and categorizing it a little bit differently so we ended up using the taxonomy access module for that has anyone else used that module? Uh, extensively. Yeah. There's I, a nickname for it too, isn't it? TAC, you call it? Yeah, TAC, Taxonomy <laughs> Access Control. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I had always gravitated gravitated towards the content access module, and uh, you know the the difference really between those is is really just one is is centered around content types, so you can have fine grained access um, even on a per node basis if you want um, for viewing any of that content, editing any of that content, um, viewing your own, accessing your own. Um, so you, you have a lot of control there. And interestingly, it also, and we'll, we'll talk about why this is important later, um, it allows you to weight the application of that permission. So you can have that access permission applied before or after other methods of taxonomy, of, of content access control. Um, and, and that's actually where I ran into trouble when I found a need to use taxonomy access control and I found out that those two things conflicted um, and it was really difficult to make those things play nicely together. Question I have for you guys that I uh, just thought of. Are you... Uh, explain the taxonomy access control a little bit. Are you setting a taxonomy term per user and that's governing access to content or is it content per that's... Per role. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically uh, what we've done is, let's say I have a blog post, which is really a knowledge base entry, and I'll put a taxonomy on it that describes which one of my products or websites that knowledge base belongs to, one or more. Yeah. That's the taxonomy on the blog post. Then I create a role that might be, um, you know, uh, related to that product, and I assign that taxonomy to it. So it then controls access from that point on. Okay, and then multiple user, uh, like a user could have multiple roles to exactly, access yeah. multiple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the first time I used it was for a client that was selling online courses. So mm -hmm. each course is a taxonomy, and then there's a role for each taxonomy. And when people purchase a, a particular course, they have that role assigned to them mm -hmm. that gives them access to the course. So... So the, I think that one of the challenges that comes into play with these kinds of solutions is that it requires the addition of more and more roles. And the more roles you have and the more modules that are installed, the greater the likelihood is that when you try and view the permission screen, it completely blows up. Um, and, and this is where that like honest assessment and planning comes in and it becomes so important um, so that you figure out um, can you know what is the smallest number of roles you can get away with? What is the most straightforward manner in which to control access to content? You know, if you know a taxonomy has to be applied, then that might be the right way to go. Um, if you likewise are thinking it's more about I want to allow these people to edit blog posts and these people to edit press releases, then content access and setting it up per content type might might work a little better. 
A great recommendation there is even before you jump into Drupal and, and building your, you know, you're building your site, in your planning phases, you know, your scope document will say, oh, we need workflow or, or access control. And when you're planning, you know, doing your wireframes and site mapping, start planning a, you know, kind of an access control workflow document where you can talk with your clients and, and say, hey, this is how we envision this working. Is this going to work for you? You know, and that'll allow you to actually point out the pitfalls uh, early on and, and get kind of it down on paper as to what, what the approach should be. And uh, one other thing, too, because sometimes you can't get away with not having a ton of roles, uh, Fast Permissions Access is a great module for that. It allows you to drill down to show one or two roles at a time, one or two modules, you know, access permissions per, at a time. Uh, so you can really get rid of seeing... 500,000 checkboxes at a time. Um, it's something that I wish I'd known about when I was building that course site, to be honest. I think we ended up, I ended up with 25 roles, and yeah, it took, it took quite a bit of time. Well, there's, there's another approach to handling authoring and access to content that we haven't talked about yet that actually um, helps could help avoid a lot of these needs, and that's organic groups. So organic groups brings with it the notion of people who are a member of the group giving them access to content, and people who are admins in the group the ability to put content into it. Um, and that, so you know, so people can belong to as many groups as you want. Um, it's not compl It's not making the the permission screen any more complicated because you set up essentially a template for permissions to cascade down on a per group basis. So if you become a member, then automatically you have access to the content as well as, um, you know, if you're an admin, then to be able to access links to create that content. You don't even have to give that, um, that user role that the person is in, the, um, the node creation permissions. It's not even necessary. Yeah, I think, I think the working in groups is extremely powerful and it's something that I'm, I'm actually using right now on a project. Uh, I think one of the more confusing aspects, though, is that it creates a completely secondary um, role permission and and user like section. Um, so sometimes, at least at first for me, it was kind of like unclear where I should be adding the permissions to give right. people access to certain pieces and restrict right. them from other pieces. Um, I I found that. Um, if you go with its defaults, then um, I think its usefulness is far more limited. But what you'll realize is you can create any content types you want and make them group content. And that then can create this whole little world for a course that can have dates, that can have assignments, that can have photo galleries, all of that stuff. Um, and as soon as it's authored and tied to that group, then um, it's the the access control is 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 pretty absolute. It's really um, it's really very thoroughly thought out, and it also gives you the ability to have a single piece of content added into multiple groups, and the access yeah. control works just fine. And um, so I, I mean I've I've worked with it a, a lot over the last few years at Schoolyard and and again recently, um, building out whole private content areas that can be repeated because creating a new group is as simple as creating a piece of content. Mm. And, yeah. and so putting that in the hands of the client makes it really easy for them to create gated and, and sort of member-only content on their own um, whenever they need more groups. That does not get it. That, that is not a replacement for some of the more granular controls of access, though. Is it like the taxonomy access control? Um, well, getting groups doesn't replace that, does it? Well, in, in many cases it may, okay. but it really... Um, you know, so yeah, I think I think in in, in, in my use case, the one thing that I think would need to happen is the ability to add group uh, membership as a sale item or as a rule. If you can do that, then yes, it could yeah, and replace it, it, everything. Absolutely, and it ties into rules, and and so you know we we've used it where um, you know there's a base group that you 
uh, as soon as your account's created, you're added into that. You just use rules. Um, so you can tie it into commerce and, you know, on purchasing this product, add them into that um, So it's pretty much the group. same thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually one of the written up use cases is, is just that. Um, it's, it's pretty good for that. I, you know, Steve, I don't know that it really addresses the use case that you have very well. Um, I mean, I think that in your case, where it's well, a single body of content right. that you want to apply to different people and products, I think the taxonomy access control is probably more appropriate. Oh, it's, de it's definitely the organic groups is overkill for what I'm trying to accomplish here. Uh, but I just, I just trying to make a different. You, you sort of brought it up in a way to almost like, well, we've talked about these things, but this thing can take care of everything. Is sort of the way it came across. Well, and no, what I meant I was, was trying it, to clarify that a little bit. Yeah, no, it's just it's a way to not tie it into roles and permissions as much as it is this sort of ad hoc organizations right. of content, right. um, because it's it's easy to have a thousand groups. It, you'd kill the site to have a thousand roles. Oh, absolutely right. So, yeah, no, so it yeah, yeah. you know it, it's that's really the the big differentiation between the two. Um, and where I really ran into trouble was trying to use content access and organic groups and um, taxonomy access control, and that's where it kind of imploded. And yeah, that, that's one really important point. Uh, you don't want to mix access modules. <laughs> Unless you want a major headache. Yeah. Well, th that that waiting feature in content access is invaluable. I believe that. Right. Um, I believe that that was implemented just to create that workaround. Specific. Yeah. So it you can use that in conjunction with organic groups nicely, but the other ones not so much. All of a sudden, either you have everything accessible or nothing, and and it's really hard to sort that out. How about field level permissions? We haven't really touched on that yet. There's a nice module that I've used called Field Permissions. I think the title of it is. Yeah, and in Drupal 6, you could actually designate fields as admin only. And and that kind of went away in Drupal 7. And then you needed to have something like this. And, and that's super useful. What kind of stuff have you used it for, Steve? Um, Used it to like add fields to the user account um, record that I didn't want users to have access to. So like so a, an internal ID the, that ties at the field, it to yeah, at the field level, really on any content type or in the account, the basic account record, you can take a field and assign it to, you know, admin author or really get very granular in saying that here's all my roles in the system and this is what each person can do for this field. They can view it, they can edit it, they can view their own, they can edit their own, just like you're looking at the permissions yeah. table. Yeah, exactly. And, and they're really, I've used it a few times. It's good for like subscription type things where you need some control, where the admin needs some control over that. They need to be able to add subscriptions to users. They need the users to be able to see what they're subscribed to but they're not allowed to edit it, and they can't see other users' subscriptions. Yeah, we've used that to tie in external IDs from other systems. When you, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to store somebody, like if you're connecting with an LDAP directory, or you know, tying into some other external data system, and you need that system's ID, you don't want the user to see it, and you don't want them to be able to change it. Yes, because they will. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Okay. So, what else so we, do we want to say about access? Is there anything we've kind of well, I, bombarded I think, it a little bit? <laughs> I think what's worth saying is what it can't do, and you know, the, and this in that sense, it's kind of an all or nothing. Either you can create this thing, mm -hmm. and when you save it, it's live, or you can't. I mean, there's no, there's no second person involvement, and there's no staging of content in any way other than unpublished but it's not possible then to have a live piece of content with a draft mode version of that content so it, you know the the unpublished way of working on a new post or a new page is only valuable or useful if it hasn't been made live yet so i think that's the segue into like okay <laughs> that's a workflow that we need to solve mm. Yeah, so it, it's pretty much just the 
authoring, not the not the actual workflow and approval uh, path. Or even just as simple as I have new ideas for this page and I want to work on it. How do I work on that when there is a live page already, and you know, and not disrupt the the existing content? Okay. There's one thing I just want to bring up here before we leave the access because it's probably appropriate here. I'm looking for it in the notes here, but um, sometimes you may have a need to rebuild your permissions. Yeah. And there is a function to do that, and it's in a very bizarre place as far as I'm concerned, but <laughs> uh, you have to go to reports and run the status report, and in there you can see a function there to rebuild permissions. Is it sit anywhere else? Does anybody know? Um, it uh, does. Yes. It's a couple other places. One of them, okay. most of these modules will have it on their configuration page somewhere. Um, uh, the, the reason why, I think the reason why it's a bit inaccessible is because it's a bit, it, it can be a, a bit database intensive and sometimes mm -hmm. it breaks things. So it's not something you necessarily want to just run willy-nilly, but occasionally you do have to run it. And typically when you install these modules, you'll get that little you know helper box or the status box at yeah. the top that says rebuild them because you always have to rebuild them at least once. Uh, when you when you install it, yeah, and, a lot a lot of these access modules will give you a warning and a link just to run it when you've configured something. But um, when I know that in Drupal six, it would it's actually under content management to post settings. Again, like completely unintuitive, and. Um, on that on that page, that's the first thing on there is is to rebuild permissions. And uh, any time you add new restrictions to authoring or access of content, very often the warning message you'll you'll get is your content access permissions need to be rebuilt. And you got to click on that. And and sometimes it's very fast. Sometimes it takes a minute or so to run. But um, you have to get up into the tens of thousands of nodes of content before it's really going to be a lengthy process. And one other thing I wanted to mention that I thought of as before we leave this section is, and maybe Nick, you have some insight here. I'm not sure permissions roll all that well with features. They didn't used to. And in fact, um, my first experience with features was white screening five or six of one of my client sites trying to revert <laughs> permissions. Um, but recently, it's actually gotten really, really good. Um, features two um, really ironed out a lot of the problems that features one has had and roles and permissions I still kind of put them in their own feature um, just in case you know out of habit mm -hmm. um, but yeah you can you can pull in you can pull in roles permissions all that all that kind of stuff I've, I've, I know the roles I've just found permissions to be buggy nope it, it works yeah. you have to oh you have to use strong arm in conjunction because it okay. won't It'll pull in the roles, but it won't actually select permissions um, because I have it working in my distribution. So when you add a new uh, when you add a new feature, then that permission gets updated so that somebody can add like, the blog or whatever. Um, so you have to you have to manually add the strong arm variable to pull in the permissions because it will pull the fact that the permission exists, but it won't pull what the value is set at without strong arm. So if you use yeah. the two two in conjunction, it, yeah, it works great. It's a lot of checkboxes, but it, yes, it, it's it's permissions are the checkbox uh, king of Drupal. So, all right, so back to our segue <laughs> that we started ten minutes ago, which was moving to um, dealing with states of content, um, and what I mean by that is having content be in a draft state, um, then maybe a live state, and then some sort of revision in between there. So let's talk about that first, and then let's talk about maybe wrapping some process around that. So something that pe a lot of people don't know, or well, let's talk about out of the box, is that out of the box of Drupal, you have the ability to turn revisions on for content. So um, every time you modify a piece of content, there's a revision kept for it. There's, there's actually two settings, I believe. One is revisions are required, and one is revisions are optional. Oh, right. So you, you can force them to create a revision every time or just allow them to decide to or not. So. I didn't realize it was an option to save it if you didn't have it enabled for that content type. 
Nope. If you enable it, you, you can either make it optional or hmm. or mandatory. Hmm. Cool. And I forget where that is. I believe that's on the content type. Yeah, I think so. Creation page, but I'm not. I'm not 100%. Um. So the, you know the other the other thing is if it's a new piece of content, you can simply uncheck the box that says published, and then only admins and the author will be able to see it. So before you make a piece of content live, you have a perfectly useful way of creating it and preventing it from being seen or indexed by search engines or anything else. And then once you have made it and you make a change, if you've turned on revisioning, it gives you something to, to, to go back to, but it doesn't give you the ability to work on something and, and make a f essentially a future, like a post-dated revision while draft. keeping the content yeah, locked. A sort of a, a, yeah. Yeah. a draft. Yeah. Actually, I have to, I have to uh, so, sorry, I have to clarify. Uh, that must be a module because by default it doesn't give you the option to make it mandatory or optional. <laughs> I, I didn't think it was, but <laughs> sorry. I didn't know. <laughs> Glad you cleared that up. Uh, an addition... So no, that, that, that brings up a funny thing, right? Is because sometimes you look in Drupal and you see the option there and you have no idea what module that you're using is actually providing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Nick, you have no idea what turned that on, right? No, it, actually, now that I look at it further, <laughs> I might have been confusing it with the preview. Oh, op the option oh, for preview? Yeah, no. Yeah, that's okay. that's optional. That's right. that's something you can set. Which, on that note, I always disable previews because it causes no end of confusion and never works. Yeah, properly. I'd same I'd same here. I it's it's a real false sense of security. Yeah. Anyway, I think John had something to say before I jumped in. I was just going to add on to uh, Jason's comment about publishing. Um, Drupal out of the box with the publish and unpublish button, depending on your level of permission, um, you always have the ability, well, depending on your permission, you have the ability to publish or unpublish something, but also, depending on that level of permission, you may not be able to get back to your unpublished content. Um, the content screen, the content list, doesn't actually allow you to view unpublished content unless you have the ability to, um, I think, edit a any kind of, and administer any t kind of content. Yeah, um, there oh, you're, is, right. you're right. There is an add-on module that will allow um, for you, based on role, to set who can see unpublished content, but uh, that is kind of a, um, can be a pitfall, especially yeah. if you're using out-of-the-box Drupal permissions to view content. Yeah, the the content overview page kind of is a pitfall in general. <laughs> I mean, it also it, one thing it does allow you to do is see content that you can't edit or can't view based on permissions occasionally. And yeah. um, listen, we we could spend an hour talking <laughs> about this page. How about the ability, the lack of the ability to find anything? <laughs> so yes. Um, yeah, the short answer is yeah. build your own view to give people the ability to see content yeah. that is published or they are the the ability to administer it. I've actually never done that. I need to do that for oh, really? a site that I'm it, working yeah, on. I now. think I always do it for content for people, especially if you have more than 100. Yeah. Uh, there's no way to find someone unless you go next, 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 next. <laughs> yep. I just spend a lot of my time doing that and checking yeah, out permissions okay. boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I can ship you over a view that I've written. <laughs> if, if you could, please, uh, both of those. Make my life easier. Um, that, you know, actually, note to selves about future episode of things to make life easier for the site admin. Hmm. Because, you know, there's so many ways that, that we work to make the site usable for the people that have to maintain it. And there's a lot of easy tricks like build your own view for users, build your own view for listing content that are so useful for site owners. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be worth worth focusing on some of those quick and easy things that you can then carry for, you know, forward from one project to the next. But there's a great question in there as to why those aren't part of core at all. Um, not even a we, search function is just... 
because we, we haven't gone and pushed to make it there. Uh, it's one of the coolest things about Drupal, but I think it's the hardest thing for people to <laughs> You're going to play the blame us card? <laughs> I'm, uh, no, I'm okay. saying that, but that's open source. If you want right. it, make it and contribute it. Okay. Actually, I think there's a couple of reasons. One, first of all, Views wasn't part of Core until Drupal 8. Yep. And one of the big pushes on that is making everything in View. The problem is the way the content page is built is interesting, to say the least. But yeah, I think we should get back on topic. Yeah. Well, but the other <laughs> thing you can do is, is make, a, make a feature or a module and contribute yeah. that. You know, right. I mean, that, that's that's the other way to that's the other way to go about it. So, revisioning that content. So, what what are some ways that we're um, let's talk about the revisioning first, so you can create drafts. Jason, you were talking about the revision module that you use often. Yeah. Um, so, to to create a you know a fairly straightforward flow, um, it's just a tweak on the way Drupal already works. By, by allowing you, instead of just saving past revisions of content, it allows you to create a revision that is a draft. It's a revision that's not live yet. And in addition to doing that, it then separates the permissions. So the module's called revisioning. So drupal.org slash project slash revisioning. Link in show notes. Um, that, um, that then separates the permissions so that you can assign permissions to create and edit that content separately from the ability to make it live on the site. And, and so that way you can create um, content authors separately from content editors or approvers. So you, you can then have somebody else, you can use rules to send an email, so if I edit something and Steve has to approve it, he'll get an email when I save that draft. When he comes back to that page, He'll get a little message box right up at the top that says, you know, you're, there is a newer version of this page waiting to go live, and, um, you know, do you want to review it? Do you want to just make it live? Um, and you can also schedule it if you want to. If you have permission, you can schedule it to go live at a certain date and time. A quick question about that. Is the first, so if you don't have permission to publish something and you create a new piece of content, is that first piece considered a revision? So um, would it, it fall under this or no? Um, no, it it does fall under this. So even creating a new piece of content, it is still a revision in draft mode. Okay. If you don't have permission to make it live, you can't make it live. Very so cool. it still works even if there's no currently live piece of content. But you can do so everything. Like you can assign it a menu, you know, a spot in the menu. You can, um, you know, do anything that you would do with a normal piece of content. Um, but it won't become, you know, published. "Quote unquote," um, until the approver says so. Okay. Is this not where a functioning preview button would be super handy? If one um, was functional, yes. Well, but that's only part of the story. Mm. I mean, it, well, it, part of it is I want to preview this, but part of it is I'm not done. I need to finish this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, so so that's. Where or, or I need some feedback. I'm almost done with this, and I'm waiting for some final numbers from somebody in accounting or whatever. Um, and and that ability to not just preview it immediately before it's going live, but but put a pause in there is is what this helps address. And I think that's again like this is another one of those things that will cover a very broad number of use cases and requirements. Um, without getting into more structured workflows that have multiple revision points and multiple states. Um, there was a workflow module that was popular in Drupal 5 um, and a little bit in Drupal 6 that was, you know, allowed all of these additional states of content. So, you know, you might have four different approval stages that it has to go through. Um, and, you know, that maybe you need that if you're doing a, um, you know, a, a site for like investor relations in a Fortune 500 company, but in most other cases, that's just massive overkill. So, so this is very similar to it sounds like in concept to the workbench moderation module from your description. It, I'm not familiar yeah, with revisioning. I, yeah, and I haven't used workbench moderation, so I mean, it'd be nice to hear sort of like the overview of that one. Yeah, I think it basically does the same thing. It's uh, workbench moderation is a 
one module in a suite from this bigger archive of modules called Workbench. But this one piece does very similar thing where it basically creates these stages of content. It's a draft, needs to be reviewed, and approved kind of states. And you do have the flexibility to add a bunch of other workflows if you want to, but that's what it, you get mm -hmm. when you install it. Um, and then you can assign the roles um, that have access to move things through those certain states. And when anyone's looking at the content, depending on what their role is, they can see what the next state is and see what they have the permissions to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the screenshots and revisioning. It looks very similar to that. <laughs> now, does it do that with images, say? So, like, if you, if you change an image between revisions, does it keep track of the old image? I don't know. That's a good question. I haven't tried that. Yeah, I would imagine it would depend on how the image has been added, but Drupal generally to. changes file names when you upload new versions, so it should work. Okay. What does revisioning do out of the box for with related to images? I'm not even sure. Um, I I don't I don't know, but I mean again, I my assumption is um, by default like. You know, I typically will use the insert module and a CCK image field or an entity right. field, and um, and and so those those are configuration things stored in the database for the record of it, and the file itself. Usually, Drupal will append a file name, a number to the file name if it has the same thing. So so all of those files exist. So a previous version is pointing to the other name of that file. So that it should work if that's the way you're doing things. If you are you doing something that's overwriting the existing file name, then you know you're you're out of luck. Um, but otherwise, it should work. Okay, then that might just solve the problem. I need to create a uh, a way for a client of mine to approve ads and view revisions of ads. And, uh, and this is this is really why we started this this show is so like the four or five of us could like figure our own problems out. Exactly. You know, hopefully somebody else gets something out of it. Like I want, I wonder as I'm as we're talking about these is why I wouldn't always include this for a website. Like um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a reason not to do this. It's a lot of times it's overcomplication. Yeah, I mean, you can. You can, you know, most projects are satisfied by the default, um, the default roles and capabilities Drupal has. Uh, it's only very specific projects, um, and in particular projects that have a lot of users entering content that really need this type of functionality. Uh, good example of that is maybe um, your company's intranet, you know. I had mentioned uh, at the beginning of the show um, a website we worked on for an intranet that uh, had 15,000 users. I mean, you have a subset of that, those, a thousand users entering content. Somebody's got to approve it. Um, I think, however, back to your question, Steve, for most sites that have, like, one user who's entering content or a team of users that trusted the trusted user, um, and is entering content, I, I don't think, you know, I think it's kind of overkill. Yeah, and if the, the other thing, too, is not necessarily the employees. If you have anonymous people adding content, then, or I, I shouldn't say anonymous, authenticated, but people, that, you know, users adding content mm -hmm. that you don't know, then you need that kind of moderation. But even there sometimes, um, many times it's, uh, you know, it's a trust-based thing. If people are abusing it, then you add this kind of stuff in. But you'll find, especially in smaller communities, people don't, as long as spam protection is good, people mm. won't abuse the permissions that they have. And then you're just adding more overhead for the admin of the site having to prove every single thing. And if 99.9% .9 of the stuff going on is good and would automatically be approved, then why not just have it? Approved automatically, and then take I, that away if it becomes a problem. Well, I'm actually, uh, as I'm talking, I'm not suggesting to add an approval process process for a small business, but I'm even thinking of just the drafting capability. To mm -hmm. if you have a blog uh, section okay. of your site or a yeah. news section, just to have the ability to yeah. save something as draft yeah. seems. I 
I think that's really useful. I, yeah. I mean, I, I do. I mean, I, I agree. I, I think I, I would be curious to look at workbench moderation to see if that is an easier default setup because it's the one thing about revisioning is that for that to really work, you have to check a lot of boxes. And it's a lot of boxes with every possible action. So the overhead of just setting it up is what keeps me from automatically putting it in every right. site. Because that you know, as soon as you turn that on, you you have a whole lot more configuration and testing that you have to do. You know, create a user in every role, log in with that user in every role and 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 really, you know, poke through things. Um, and you know, if you do it more often, sure, it gets easier. But uh, there's a list of things that we do every time, and and that's just not one that, um, for better or for worse, I haven't gotten used to doing it. And uh, this is where I say creating your own distribution is <sighs> blah worth blah the blah. Effort. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway. John, I think you had something to add there. Um, I did. <laughs> you guys, you guys did a pretty good job of. Thank oh, you. that's what it was. All right. Um, Nick had mentioned uh, the administrator having to approve um, all of these people entering content. Um, I know with uh, Workbench, and maybe this is true for revisioning as well. You can actually have. Uh, different approval processes depending on what content you're creating. So, for example, you know, you have managers of departments that need to approve this content. Depending on what piece of content I create, it can go off to a different person for approval. Um, so, it's not always just one person saying, yes, that content is good, publish it. Um, it, it can be a group of people or a team of people. Now, does this utilize dashboard, the dashboard, or does it it kind it does of. when uh, okay. when a user logs in using um, moderation, um, you, uh, right on their user screen, there's actually a um, dashboard kind of uh, effect where you have uh, stuff that you created, uh, stuff that is waiting. Uh, if you're an approver, stuff that's waiting to be approved. Um, if you're not an approver, you have stuff that either needs to be edited, somebody kicked it back to you, or stuff that's been approved. So it, it does a uh, workbench does a really great job of kind of managing that workflow and kind of helping you along the way to see, you know, what's out there, what needs to be approved, what isn't approved, what can you approve, what can't you approve, what can you edit, and what can't you edit, um, and that all comes within uh, the base workbench module and then a couple of add-on modules, um, moderation being one of them. Okay. Very cool. That was something I hadn't really looked at um, what it might do in um, in the dashboard because I did the most extensive work um, with the revisioning module in Drupal 6 where Workbench didn't exist. Mm -hmm. I still think it doesn't exist there. Um, but I was able to easily create a block um, and display that actually in a sidebar for any... Um, administrative user that has stuff to approve so that they would always see the list of things that are waiting for them to, to, to look at. Um, and we ended up actually doing that for them basically anywhere on the website. So as soon as they came to it, if they were signed in, they'd have just like this little block on the side under the navigation that says, you know, you have so many things to approve. Here's the, the most recent five. And you can, you know, view them and approve them really quickly. Now, does it tie in with views book operations, so allow you, you know, allowing you to prove many, many things at once? Or yeah, oh yeah, yeah, you can do, you can do that. Okay. Um, I haven't, I haven't had occasion to work with this stuff too extensively in D7, so I'm, I'm eager to sort of do a comparison of those two and see. Well, in, in, in version seven, the workbench sticks a menu right up in your admin bell black bar that says my workbench. Oh, cool. Basically, gives you all your based on who you're logged in as, your workflow is right there for you. Cool. Yeah, we're we're working um, we're working with an agency on a, a publication website right now, um, and actually just starting to prototype things. So I'm definitely gonna check that out and, and add that in there. One of them anyway. I think sure. work Workbench is probably more likely the right one. 
we have node access user reference listed in here. Um, yeah, I added that. Okay. Um, what is that? One, uh, a lot of times, and we've talked about this quite a bit, you have um, access permissions based on roles um, or taxonomy or something that isn't as granular as you need it to be. Um, we actually found that uh, for uh, one of our clients, we needed them to be able to select users to be able to edit certain pages on the site. So it, it, the way that that worked was it was a web team that was managing all of these sub pages and that they would be granting permission to users. These users were coming in via an LDAP connection and through the LDAP server. Um, so what this module actually allows you to do is to use a user reference or an entity reference field to select users from a list and give them permission to um, edit, publish, um, create certain types of content. And you can actually select, when you add that um, user reference to the content type, you can select what the user that is selected there will have the ability to do. Hmm. To, uh, do. Um, even to the point of visibility, can view the page, cannot view the page, so on and so forth. So it kind of adds another, uh, a little bit more granular um, support for uh, accessing content and editing content. It, so it, it in in essence, it almost creates multiple authors. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And where this came into play was um, they had uh, department subsites, and the department subsites could be authored by two people. Um, but could only be viewed by people that were in that department. So it came down to a role for the department that allowed people to view that that section and then allowing those two people to be able to go in and edit that uh, page. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I messed around with this module a while back. I found that it didn't, and it could have just been my quickly giving up on it, but I found that it wasn't playing well with some of the other permissions, like field permissions module. I found it's, that there was some conflicts. It it's, um, took some configuring, but mm. uh, I think the newer, the newer versions of it are working a lot better with those and the permissions mm -hmm. set. That actually brings up another good point, too. A few episodes ago, one of the first episodes... We talked about how you evaluate a module. When you get to like a, a node access module, um, the, the standards are a lot higher, um, at least for me, um, because it has the potential for breaking everything. Um, if I find that I'm having to install a dev mod a dev version, or there's not it's not really supported very well. Um, I'm, I'm much more leery and much less likely to actually use the module if it's node access or permissions related. Yeah, that's that's one of those things where you need to do your own homework and really, really test things and and plan well. I mean, again, it's just you know we said this at the very beginning. We you have to plan exactly what are the use cases that you need to support. You know, both from an end user side and from a content administrator administer side. Uh, in order to make sure that you can use as few modules as possible, you know, find that that most sound method that you can that you can think of, whether it's content access or or TAC or organic groups, um, and and sort of pick the approach that that fits best. Um, you know, something like field access that probably plays well with most of them, but then you get into these other cases of. Um, Content access allows you to assign permissions down to the individual node. And then, you know, the one John was just talking about allows you to set access down to the individual user. You know, those are the ones that are most likely to, to trip up when you add them and layer them on with, with other kinds of access control. Okay. So anything else in our list here that we want to bring up? Um, any tips? Yeah, the uh, the Devel module is mm -hmm. extremely valuable when you're dealing with complex permissions. Um, 
I believe it's an option, not by default, but it, there's an option in the develop module that lets you see when you're on a node or on a view or on a page, what roles can access it, um, why they can access it, what kind of access they have, whether they can edit it, view it, change it, um, or what, and it, and it tells you why, or at least why it thinks it, you should be able to. Um, so we'll say, for example, anonymous users can view this because um, it's a public group, or it might say uh, department users can edit this because they're, uh, it's assigned as an admin on this role. Um, it's extremely valuable when trying to figure out what's what. Um, it also has the ability to switch users for testing very quickly, although there's another module that I think we'll talk about a little bit later in the show that might be better for that. Um, but I'm finding, I find that the more complex access is, the more I end up using Devel. So That's a good tip. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, in the um, in the um, workbench module, they actually have a utility in there that when you get a certain configuration, you click a link and it will test the uh, permissions for you and sort of give you a summary hmm. in English to show you what it thinks it, it's configured like so you can get a better sense of... Hmm. So you, you kind of pick the configuration and the user and the content type, and it will do an evaluation for you. So it's kind of going after that same kind of thing yeah. to try to help I'm you. To check, I'm going to have to check that out. And I would yeah. say that... Keep your mind around it, yeah. It's still necessary to test it yourself. Oh, absolutely. And these are just uh, yeah, yeah. these are just kind of general guidelines, and, and they kind of yeah. help you to rapidly uh, make the changes and check them, but you need to <laughs> test it. Yeah, I, re I recently had a situation on a website where I had I was using uh, field permissions and I had it really configured down to the custom section of a real particular usage and I went to a screen and I was like, oh, this is wrong, let me go fix it. And I'd go fix it and then I went back to a different screen with the same field and it wasn't working right and I kept toggling back and forth. I think there's something wrong with the system, but it's actually me not understanding the permissions properly. I was ter fixing it in one section and breaking it in another one, and then that went on for a couple of days till I realized what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is one thing. Permissions sometimes on uh, you know on the content access page or on the permissions page aren't necessarily the most clearly defined. Uh, like, uh, let me pull up an example. Um, I, I think they're actually pretty well defined. I just think that us programmers don't have the patience to read through that giant well, page of stuff. No, <laughs> no. Well, there, what's, there's some what, really weird combinations. Yeah, like what, what's the difference <laughs> there's, between there's some stuff that's by, pretty weird. bypass content access control, administer content types, administer content. Like it doesn't clearly say, like for example, like obviously bypass content access control allows that role to do anything to any content that they want. Um, administering content types allows people to create content types, delete them, and make changes. But what does administer content do? It allows you to administer the content. Well, it allows you to administer any kind of content. It brings with it access to the content page, and it also governs whether or not you get access to a number of the vertical tabs. Yeah. And, and that's where it can get really... Particularly uh, the published Publish. Tab. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's so that, you know, oftentimes you don't really want to give people that administer content functionality because you really only want them to be editing one particular kind of content, but they need to be able to publish and unpublish it. And and without adding in modules, you can't do that. Like, that's that's where you get into the corners of that core permissions where it's, hard to know exactly what you're getting when you check that box. And that's why you've got to have those other accounts open to, to see what is this, what changes in this admin page. And that when. particular setting is, right, that's not per content type. So it's no. either on or yeah. off. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which was always a little confusing. Yeah, and, and another thing to be careful, you always have to be careful about certain permissions like, for example, administer permissions. So, like, if you give somebody the administer permissions permission, <laughs> Don't then do you're that. essentially giving them a super admin, um, a super admin 
role because then they can give themselves everything. Um, well, and that's when and the, usually what you really need to do is not give them access to permissions, but give them access to putting someone in the right role. Yeah, and that's but actually it, where I was gonna yeah, talk roll, about. Roll assign. Yes. That's so. Sorry, I didn't mean to hijack you. Nick. No, 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 that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, you want to allow a site admin to put to create more content editors, but what you don't want to allow them to put somebody in a global administrative role or or elevate themselves. So role assign allows you to create a role that can assign people to other specified roles, and that's critical. So the site admin should be able to put people in roles up to and maybe including themselves, their own role, but no higher. And that's that's the way you can govern it is by adding in the role assign module. And then there's one final module that I want to talk about, and that's custom permissions. I don't know if you guys have ever used that, but it allows you to create permissions based on URL. Hmm. Um, and that's something that I used on a site recently because in addition to role assign, I needed to um, allow users to create. Actually, I could just look it up because um, it's actually kind of interesting. I needed them to be able to assign group roles, but not change group permissions because it's again, it's like a whole other level, and that permission doesn't exist on the group permissions page. So I was able to add a custom permission that allowed them to add people there but not um, not change roles after they've done that. Huh. Um, so custom permissions is something that um, I, I've found is actually pretty useful. And if you could visit the issues page and review the patch that I submitted, um, that'd be great too because <laughs> there was a bug that needed some fixing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's... I think that that um, is sometimes more valuable than anything because what it does is it creates a new permission on the permissions tab related to whatever you called it, and then you can grant individual pages permission to individual roles. Hmm. So, among other things, it, it gives a couple by default. Like for example, uh, by default allows it gives a new permission for setting clean URLs, administering file system. So basically, allows you to create an administrator that can't access the back end. Cool. All right. So let's get past this. I think we've said a lot today. I think it was very helpful. It's helpful for me anyway. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, and let's just uh, we have our module of the week. I think this was submitted by John. Is that is that right? It wasn't. Masquerade. Yeah, yeah Masquerade. Masquerade <laughs> okay. allows you to very quickly switch users. So if you're in a user that has permission to change users, uh, you can hover over um, you can hover over your name in the top toolbar, and it'll show you a list of recently logged in users, and you can switch to them and test out their permissions. Um, as I'm saying this though, that I have Masquerade and Devel in, so Devel actually might be the module giving me access to that. <laughs> But I know that Masquerade also allows you to switch users, and if that's all you need, without so everything that's else, like a develop fast does. user switching. Yeah, capability. It actually logs you in as a user. You don't need to know their password. You don't have to have a million testing set up. Um, if it's if it's a live site, if a, so, for example, if a user is saying, "Hey, I can't do this," you can log in as them without changing their password or knowing their password. Does it, the does it does it switch the? Um... Does it switch the themes that they're looking at and everything? It switches. It, yeah. You become that user. Yeah. Okay. You are um, you are that user. So it's it's the alternative to creating an incognito window. Yes, and and you have to log back out and log back in as the admin. Like it literally logs you in. So oh, there's no way, oh, there's you have no to way actually of, have to log out. Yeah, unless they have the uh, permission to switch as well, which you wouldn't probably want. Oh, to okay. Do. All right. So yeah, the everything changes. Well, but but you know, in combination with creating, you know, if you create a user in each, you know, typical role, test yeah. user, and and then you put those specific users, you know, give those specific users the ability, you know, a role that allows them to user switch. Oh uh, that yeah, that that's still, that's a little test suite. So you could go back and forth between 
average logged in user, paid subscriber, site admin, whatever. That's super clever, actually. I need to set that up <laughs> <laughs> because that's it's, such a pain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we you know we typically in our sandbox we already have a bunch of test users set up, and that's you know we'll have those in place so that we can kind of go through and, and test things after we've set up all the functionality, and then we'll just you know dump them before the site goes live. Um, but yeah, that's okay. this would be a much quicker way than having like four different browsers open, you know. Excellent. Anything uh, else? And there are almost twenty nine thousand sites installed uh, reporting that they're running Masquerade, so it's seems to be pretty robustly used um, and fairly recently um, updated. So. Yeah, it's pretty solid. I'm I'm ninety percent sure that. That's coming from Masquerade, not <laughs> not from Devel, because uh, I think Devel just gives a block. All right, I think we've come to the end of episode twelve. Cool. Um, any parting words from anyone, Jason? Um, really excited that we just got approved to start working on a project um, with Yale University. So that was that was really exciting. Um, we've uh, spoke there um, at their Drupal event in, in February, I think, or March. Um, but uh, this is the first project that we have that's start off, and it's it's a really neat sort of map interface based website that should be really cool. Yeah. Sounds interesting. How about you, John? Uh, I'd like to say I'm John Picozzi, and I approve this content. Excellent. And you, Nick? <laughs> uh, I don't know how to follow that. I've, uh, I'm actually. <laughs> I've actually been uh, consulting with a company in, in Worcester, uh, working on a really big uh, franchise kind of site. And I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it's a pretty interesting use case. It's kind of following a lot of these issues that they're having. I think they're going to end up going with organic groups uh, to kind of control which franchise uh, can edit what and what the uh, what the home office can do. Well, that's great. Cool. So and. Um I'm Stephen Cross, and I'm just going to tell you, if you want to reach out to us, you could leave us a voicemail, and you could be the first one to do that at 206-377-6313, or you could email us at talkingdrupal at gmail.com. And, boys, I guess we'll talk next week. All right. Take Thanks, care, Steve. everybody. Bye. Cheers. Have a good one.